Welcome to This Week in Intelligent Investing, where we examine timely and timeless investment topics to help you become a better investor. Enjoy authentic, unscripted discussion featuring Chris Bloomstrand, Phil Lordway, Elliot Turner, and other thought-leading investors. Brought to you by MOI Global. And now, here is your host, John Mihaljevic. A very warm welcome to everyone to this new episode of This Week in Intelligent Investing. Such a great pleasure to have the whole crew with us this week. Uh, we've got Elliot Turner, Chris Bloomstrand, and Phil Ordway. And we've got three great topics coming up. So stay with us uh, and stay for the discussion. Elliot, I'm going to go to you first. Why don't you kick us off? Awesome. Thank you, John. I uh, have something new and exciting, I think. We got our first, or I got uh, through direct message over Twitter, um, a user submitted question. So, you know, obviously, I think one of the points is if you're out there and you're listening and you have some questions, please do send them to us. It helps with uh, making sure that what we talk about is relevant and interesting. Um, this question came from Michael Bokoff, and I think it's something we could all, uh, each of us should try to answer. Um, really interesting question. So Michael asked about my approach to screening and idea generation, how I allocate research time, uh, time for research efficiency, and how has that evolved over my career? Um, what do I think is the right hurdle for doing enough diligent work to assess an area of exploration without overcommitting and becoming subject to the sunk cost fallacy? And Michael found John's MOI book extremely helpful on that front as well. So, you know, as as did I when I was uh, putting together some of my own thoughts. Um, so to talk about idea generation in general, when I first started doing this uh, professionally, I was pretty reliant on screens. I would run a lot of screens. I mean, mostly some like not very creative derivatives of the magic formula. I was always, you know, finding the idea of quality uh, and cheapness appealing. I had a little bit of a growth overlay because I'm GART by nature. I wanted something that was growing at least a little bit. And I'd pick through the screens and I kind of, you know, instead of mechanistically, you know, uh, um, as Greenblatt would say, uh, going for everything, I'd try to overlay, you know, my screening criterion, uh, qualitative screening criterion, like did this stock look interesting? Was it worth uh, the time? I have basically given up entirely on screens. And by given up, I mean, I just don't do them. I don't think they're very rewarding for me and I don't think they've helped me much. Um, one thing that I think has been extremely helpful is over the course of doing this uh, now for a decade plus, I've built up a deep well of knowledge on a bunch of companies, industries, sectors, and I have a long history with some companies that I feel I know quite well and I have a good sense of what they do and don't do well and where they are and are not good value. Um, but more importantly, I think the, the more holistic change in my approach to idea generation is I rely far more on what's interesting and what interesting people I speak to are telling me I should look at. Um, and, you know, I've found that the more I follow my interests, the better work I do. And then when I invest in something, inevitably, the more conviction I'm able to have in it because I know it better inherently because I am interested in it. Um, so as far as research, research is concerned, like I'm convinced there's no sunk cost at all. Um, so long as you're doing the actual work and you're kind of leaving your biases aside. If you think in terms of sunk cost, you're going to put yourself in position to make uh, unforced errors uh, that are behavioral in nature. So you're going to make some bad decisions because you feel like, oh, I've spent this much time working on this, therefore I have to act. Um, instead, you know, my framework is more general. Uh, I think knowledge compounds. So if you spend a lot of time learning about a company, you learn about their industry, you dive deeper, get to know all their competitors, you get to know the entire like ecosystem that they're working within, how they treat all their stakeholders, and then you don't invest. Well, you know, it might lead you to something really interesting in an adjacent area, um, or it might lead you to something interesting way down the line. You just don't know when that time would come. But I've, you know, I think part of it was being a little older. Um, I, I wouldn't call myself old. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm still kind of young for the industry, but I, I 
go to think about how long my time frame should be in investing, and it's going to be really long. I'm going to be around for a long time, knock on wood, hopefully. Um, and the idea is that somewhere, somehow along the way, I'll be able to capitalize on this well of knowledge I'm building and and letting it compound for me. Um, so, you know, some of the best ideas that I've gotten actually started from working in different areas. Uh, uh, you know, I, I mentioned Roku here probably far too much. I mean, it's one of my larger positions that I'm more interested in. My work on Roku actually was born out of my work on the trade desk. And I hardly uh, had much investment history with the trade desk. Uh, I had a brief one and it was okay. It could have been a lot better had I stuck with it. But, you know, my knowledge and, and effort toward the trade desk entirely informed my interest. And, and it, it was like an immediate precursor to my interest in Roku. So I've spoken to how my experience of whiffing on Shopify informed my uh, actual investment in Roku. But the idea was born out of an interest in trade desk. So I really like these kind of adjacencies that you just don't know um, that your work will lead you down that path. Um, so I think the most important thing is to be interested, to do deep work, to follow your interest, to follow your nose on that. And, you know, I, I don't really know what the right hurdle is for, for doing enough diligent work. Um, I think every situation is a little different. Sometimes if it's an area where you've done a lot of background work and you're really familiar, the hurdle is going to be a little lower than where it's somewhere entirely novel. Um, I've often said that some of my favorite ideas are those that I do work on in a highly incremental way. I keep coming back to them and there's something that just keeps sucking me in that I can't look away. And you know, over time, the opportunity itself hasn't gone away, that the idea keeps drawing me back in. And you know, that could take a couple of years before I actually pull the trigger and make an investment. Um, but it's something that you know, it, for some reason, there's this gravity. There's something about the idea that I can't get away from. It, it, it's uh, my favorite kind of uh, approach to, to getting really involved in something. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll ask all you guys, how do you, how do you uh, answer the question? Who wants to go first, guys? I'll, I'll start. I mean, I think you raised a couple of exceptionally important points, which is if you're not interested, you're not going to do the work that you need to do. So I think it's a very different environment when you're assigned a sector or you're assigned a project or a specific company uh, based on your employer's desires and you have to go chase it down, which can be a very good way to learn, you know, kind of the wax on process as a young analyst or something. That's all fine and good. I certainly did that and benefited from it. And I think it can lead to a fresh set of eyes. But I think um, the deeper you go, the more concentrated you get, the more you want to take an interest as a first screen. And so I think it, you know, for my style, for example, I mean, my sort of filters are I have to be interested in it because I, I really do take an ownership and a business first perspective on it. So if it's not something that I really have some sort of intrinsic interest in, I'll probably pass. Now I'm interested in a lot of things, so that helps. But there are some really arbitrary things. You know, I could be interested in one industry but not another, even though they're, you know, in the same SIC code or something, right? It's just it, it is somewhat arbitrary. But I, I really do take the perspective that I'm going to be studying it, investing in it, owning it, involved with it for hundreds or thousands of hours over a multi-year period. And so my my knowledge and, and expertise threshold, which which you kind of got at, Elliot, is I want to be able to say that, you know, the next day or the next week, I could step in as a very credible board member and contribute right away to a board level meeting. So I'm detailed, I'm I'm versed in, you know, what's what matters to the business. I know what's going on. I'm certainly not going to be as knowledgeable as or effective as a as an executive inside the company, but certainly kind of board level expertise would be. Uh, my personal threshold. And then, you know, I think it just goes with the territory that you're going to waste a lot of time in that process or seemingly waste a lot of time. So the point about having no sunk cost is just absolutely crucial. And I think back to some comments Jason Zweig made about um, writing Thinking Fast and Slow with Danny Kahneman. And Danny Kahneman is just legendary for saying that he actually takes some sort of perverse pride in not having sunk costs. And he likes to change his mind all the time because it means he's learning something. But you know, even in terms of a work product, you know, that's why it took him so long to write that book, apparently, is he would write hundreds of pages and just tear them up and say, they're no good. Let's start over. Um, and I think that has to apply here as well. I mean, you, you spend dozens or hundreds of hours going in one direction and realize that 
you got it all wrong. The price doesn't make sense. Management's got a fatal flaw. It's, you know, something else is more interesting. Um, I think those are the the hard decisions you have to make and you just have to live with. And you, you can't view it as, you know, a wasted opportunity. And that's why the good news is if you make the first filter something you find at least personally interesting, then nothing really is wasted because you can always apply that down the road to something else. Yeah, I'll jump in and add that I think to your point, Elliot, there's there's just a cumulative um, knowledge of business. There's a cumulative knowledge of industry. There's a cumulative knowledge of companies that only comes from spending time on company after company after company, industry after industry. You know, you've got a circle of competence of nothing, but probably negative when you are young and you enter the business. You learn some things in business school. You may do some investment clubs. You may get to run a chunk of a school's endowment, but you really don't have a, a broad circle of competence. And yeah, I, I'm going to offend a whole bunch of people here, but my observation over the years has been, and I think it's getting worse, and I think it's getting worse because of social media and more access to a lot of great thinkers. But I think there are far too many people trying to manage money and invest capital that spend way too much time watching what others do, reading their client letters, um, looking at their portfolios. And, you know, and I see this through the social media in particular today, very little deep understanding of business and industry. And I'm I'm generalizing. There there are a lot of smart cats on Twitter. There are a lot of exceptional investors all over the country and all over the world. But I'm, but my, my sense is, Fewer and fewer people are spending enough time reading quarterly filings, reading annual filings, reading proxies, reading deeply on industry information, you know, talking to businesses, talking to competitors. And, you know, here I am 30 years in professionally, and, you know, I look back at, at where I've really made progress as an investor. And it's been, it's been through just reading over and over and over again. You know, I've never run a lot of screens where I have and where they've been useful is once I had a working list of companies in place and, you know, these these are businesses where, you know, they, they meet financial characteristics, they're in industries that I understand, they generate good returns on capital, the balance sheets are in good shape, I like managements. So, you know, I've maintained a universe of a few hundred companies over time and we're always trying to add new names to the universe. We're always trying to delete names from the universe but there's no substitute to maintaining your, your working knowledge of those businesses. I think there's no substitute in my case. And I've done, you know, I, I've talked about the value line. Mr. Buffett has talked about the value line, but there, there's been no better tool over my career as an investor to receiving the printed copies of both the large cap and then the small and mid cap editions of, you know, a, a whole bunch of businesses and a whole bunch of industries quarterly updated. So four times a year, you get a look at the value line on a company. And, you know, it's a great place to start if you're not familiar with a company. Uh, you know, I would look at, a, I would look for a value line tear sheet, or I would go to the Bloomberg and I would simply look at, at the summary, summary financial analysis pages, you know, quick snapshots of cash flow statement, balance sheet income statements, the key financials. And I'm trying to get a sense of what a business has looked like over time. And it's only for the repeatability of that process and then ultimately spending a whole bunch of time, the vast, vast majority of my time spent as an investor for 30 years has been reading filings, understanding businesses. And so from an idea generation standpoint, you know, I find, you know, at a, at a point in your career, you're not really lacking for new ideas. You know, the process involves staying current trying to figure out where your weaknesses are, trying to figure out where a business doesn't make sense, but then you've got to wait for price. And again, probably all, all four of us have talked about, you know, price kind of being the last thing, but it winds up being the last thing in the sense that when we're trying to put money to work, the price has got to be right. And so you can spend, you know, years, you can spend decades waiting for a business that happens to be a terrific business. And, you know, along comes a broad market meltdown, along comes you know, a shift in the industry where some of their competitors are losing ground and they're gaining ground. There are all kinds of reasons why the price ultimately has to be right. But screening has worked where, where you know, I've, I've not been familiar with companies in Australia or not been familiar with companies in Switzerland. And you run a screen based on fundamental characteristics that appeal to you as an investor. And you'll turn over some rocks with smaller cap businesses or some international businesses. But yeah, I, I suppose, you know, my, my broad comment is there's no replacement for, you know, the 
Mr. Munger adage of, you know, sitting on your ass and just doing a whole bunch of reading. And I would avoid the macro and I would spend a lot more time just doing it company by company by company. Yeah. And I guess one thing I'd, I'd add too on the, the screening topic, since Elliot brought that up as well, is I, I'm not one of these holier than now uh, guys who thinks that screening is bad. I think screening can be very effective. I just think before you do anything, whether it's screening, whether it's talking to other people, whatever your process entails, you have to decide whether you're going to look at the business first or the security first. And if you're looking at the security first, then it might make sense to just, you know, scrape 13 Fs and create portfolios from that or, you know, run factor models and try to put together portfolios on that basis. Um, screens can certainly be a part of that kind of process. But, you know, if you're a business first investor, you're just looking at screens to find one or two things that might jump out so you can start the process there. It doesn't end there. It's just a tiny, you know, a little flake of snow on the top of a hill to get the snowball rolling uh, in the process. So I, I, I use screens occasionally. Like you said, it tends to be an area where I'm looking for either something really unusual that, that sticks out or an area where I'm really green and naive and it's just the very beginning. Yeah, the caveat to what I said and, and consistent there, Phil, with what you just said is there are a whole bunch of ways to skin the cat. I mean, there are a lot of ways to invest capital. There are a lot of sure. ways to invest capital in the stock market. And if you're going to run factor analysis, if you're going to if you're going to screen on you know price to book, price to sales, you know if you, if you if you're trying to find businesses within an industry, and ferret out and screen based on differing fundamentals within an industry, and allocate money that way, terrific. But you know in my small corner of the world where I run very concentrated portfolios of you know a handful of businesses, you know I've I, I've I've got to know the business like the back of my hand, and so you know my process. Uh, lends itself less to screening and you know less to new, less to new idea generation than it does um, you know to a deep understanding of of the businesses that I own and their competitors and always always being on the lookout for new companies. But it's a it, it, totally different approach. I mean, it's way less important to screen in my world than it would be in in different ways of investing capital. Yeah, I love that way Phil defined it as board level knowledge as the threshold for getting involved. I feel like that's perfect, uh, perfect way of putting it. I think all of us look to get that sort of deep intimacy with what we're investing in. Um, and I, you know, I, I'd say this as far as screening is concerned, there is one use I have for it in recent times. It's you know, I, I have this list of companies and the prices I'd get involved, and you know that that I know pretty well. Um, but occasionally when markets make really big moves, I'll run a screen and see if any of the companies um, that I've been watching end up on, you know, one of the interesting screens. Um, Cause that could be a good signal that they'll have some sort of broader appeal to other kinds of investors as well. And that I should be thinking about it uh, more so than I am by virtue of uh, merely having it on a list with a price. Um, so I think that's pretty cool. Uh, I liked Chris, uh, how you said, you know, like too many people are doing what other people do. I think, you know, Munger was speaking about that not long ago, maybe it was a year ago where he told people not to invest like lemmings. I feel like there are way too many people there that aren't all that original. And, uh, you know, some of that gets back to, I think it's related to focusing on your interests. You have to be true to yourself as an investor. And part of the battle is it, it, there, there are two things. It's one thing to have a good idea, but it's another to be able to see it through. And if your portfolio isn't true to you, it's going to be very hard to see your ideas through, even your really good ones. Um, and so you end up in the situation where you're just churning through with high velocity a lot of other people's ideas that are half baked in your own head. Um, so, you know, and, and it goes to if you are going to put an idea on your list that someone else introduced to you, uh, a phrase that I've liked about taking that is you, you can't just co-opt their thesis, you have to make it your own. You have your own worldview, you have your own lens, you have you know, your own process for getting to know something. Um, so someone could introduce an idea to you, but you have to make it your own in your own unique way. Um, so I think you know, a lot of this is about uh, self-awareness and understanding yourself and what, what you need to do to put yourself in a position to succeed. Yeah, I'll jump in. I think you know, that's, that's a great point, Elliot. You know, to build up that conviction because inevitably uh, investments will go up as well as down. And uh, when it does go down, if you're relying on somebody else's thesis, uh, you're going to be in trouble. So that's, I think, really key. I, I try to do that myself. In fact, one of the filters I have is 
basically, do I feel like I know this company well enough that I could make a educated bid for the whole business and would feel comfortable actually buying the, the whole company at a certain price? Um, so another point, this idea of you know cumulative knowledge, I think that's just so key and there's no way around just looking at tons of companies, uh, reading their annual reports, reading industry um, reports and, you know, just, just general reading. I think you build up that knowledge over time. Uh, screening for me, um, it does have a role, you know, sometimes I just want to kind of throw more companies on the list and, uh, you know, you can just run very simple screens in terms of just a market cap range or a certain geography where you haven't looked before, um, you know, basically, it's just a way to kind of generate some uh, some reading uh, ideas and then delving into those companies. Um, so that's the kind of screening that uh, that I do over here. I'll add one other thing. You know, we, we, we talk about kind of cumulative wisdom and cumulative knowledge that comes from reading and, again, reading all of the, the various filings. And I wouldn't have thought about it at the outset. And it's really only, you know, here you know, later in my investing career that it's really dawned on me, but there's, there's a, a enormous value to developing a network of folks inside of industries. And it's not necessarily just talking to the CFOs and the CEOs, but it's, it's, you know, clients that, that work in various industries. You know, I'm blessed with a large roster of clients that cross a lot of gamuts, a lot of business owners, a lot of, you know, very accomplished equity owners of private businesses network of a lot of CEOs, CFOs, and, you know, folks that know that when I pick up the phone and I have a series of questions that I'm not looking for quarterly earnings, I'm not looking for how are we going to do on, on the sales front for the next three months or six months. But you know, I think that, I think, you know, you know, without necessarily setting out to do it, you know, if you kind of follow that Phil Fisher method of scuttlebutt, that there's just an enormous utility to, to, to surrounding yourself and you're kind of having at your fingertips you know, a deep Rolodex of a, a lot of wisdom on the other side of the telephone. The other thing I would add too is, um, yeah, I, I'm not trying to, as I mentioned before, I'm not trying to be dismissive of any other uh, ways of doing it. Like you said, Chris, there's lots of ways to skin the cat and, and they can all have their place. And I think it should be uh, the driving factor. There should be what suits your personality, what suits your capital base, what suits your interests. But where I think people really get in trouble and I see this quite a bit, is where I start talking to somebody and I describe my process or what I'm generally looking for you know, in an investment idea. And they respond with what they think I'm looking for and they start telling me what they're doing. And they're really just convincing themselves that they're doing things a certain way when they're not. So again, if you invest uh, you know, a broadly diversified portfolio, lots of things that you found on a screen, that's great. It's just, it's a totally different approach than what I'm describing. And so if, if you tell me, oh yeah, I invest in a tiny handful of ideas and I hold them for a period of years and I really think of myself as a business first investor, well, how'd you find the idea? Well, I got it out of somebody's 13F filing and I didn't really do much work beyond that. that that's how you really get in trouble, right? So I think that's where people just need to be honest with themselves about what they're doing and what their strengths and weaknesses are. Great. Well, I think we've... Uh answered that question uh, that came in. As Elliot said, uh, we do encourage our listeners uh, to send in questions. You can tweet to us, you can email us. Uh, we'll be happy to, uh, to kind of make them a topic of our episodes. Um, Chris, I'll go to you for uh, what you got for us today. Yeah, with, with Berkshire having announced their earnings this past Saturday, I thought I would do as I did last quarter and just kind of scroll through some some general thoughts on some of the moving parts in the business, um, answer any questions you guys might have, you know, get any of your input. But, you know, Berkshire is such a big holding of ours, and I, I write about it um, pretty deeply every year in my annual letter. I tend to not do as much work on the intra-quarter because, um, you know, Berkshire's like an aircraft carrier or a battleship. You know, it takes a lot to move it. I think a lot of the perspective on the business kind of gets misunderstood in the broad media. Um, you know, I sit here and look at the quarter just ended, and I've got some pretty general takeaways, almost all of which are positive. 
you know, Berkshire's stock uh, for the better part of the year has been down. Um, you know, a couple of days ago, it actually crept into positive territory for the year. You know, I think looking at their their gap earnings is just a meaningless exercise. You've got to do as we do a whole bunch of work to kind of get to what you think the real durable economic earning power of the business is. And when I go through that exercise, as I just did here at quarter end, you know, I can start with, I think the first, you know, kind of the go-to point here in the last few years, which has been share repurchases. And obviously everybody saw the headline number, Berkshire bought back $9 billion or thereabouts in the quarter. Um, subsequent to the quarter, if you kind of get into the detail, and even on the very front page of the queue, you saw another shrink in the share count. Um, they bought back another 2.4 or 2.5 billion shares, depending on the price they paid. So, you know, so far this year, they've spent $11.5 billion, which is a big number. Uh, they bought back almost $5 billion in 19, a little over a billion dollars the year before. So cumulatively now, you're pushing almost $25 billion over the course of the last almost three years at prices that that really make sense. Um, you know, I think the, the, the only knock you could make, and I'm not sure it's a knock, uh, but, you know, my observation is there appears to be some price sensitivity as to the prices being paid. Berkshire reports on a monthly basis how much they've spent on share repurchase and at what prices. And so just in the last three months in, you know, of, of the third quarter, July, they bought $2 billion at an average of 187 on the B shares, 281 on the A's, uh, accelerated the repurchases. In the next month, $3 billion, 3.1 actually, $210 on the B shares, 317 on the A, so increasing. And then here at the end of the quarter in September, the, the largest purchase that Berkshire has ever made on a, on a, on a, on a, on a monthly basis, $3.7 billion at 216 on the Bs and 325 on the A. So you scratch your head and wonder, well, you know, is there pr- just no price sensitivity? Or are we now targeting a percentage of operating earnings to spend? And I guess my, my, my takeaway would be, to Berkshire's credit would be, you know, you went through an absolute meltdown where a whole bunch of your businesses stopped, your retail establishments closed, your manufacturing facilities closed, industrial production around the world fell by a third to a half in places, railroads were shipping less goods. So, you know, Mr. Buffett had a firsthand seat at this veritable train wreck that was unprecedented in all of time. And You know, I think you look at the numbers broadly for all of these various companies that we all pay attention to that have been releasing third quarter earnings, and and you're getting somewhat of a V-shaped recovery. The third quarter was immensely better than the second quarter. You know, the the, the pandemic didn't really get going until the middle of March. You know, I think there was a sense by the end of June that things were improving, but you just saw incremental improvement as you went through the third quarter. And here today, we've got, you know, a lot of our manufacturing base back running. Uh, you know, we're still way down in terms of a lot of the service sector. You know, we're running 40% of capacity in terms of, of airlines. Um, load factors are up, but we're not flying all the planes. So there's still a, an enormous amount of weakness in the broad economy. But through the lens of Berkshire, things are improving. And I think you can see that in the sherry purchases. And, you know, if, if, if you're spending $3.7 billion in a month to buy shares, at 216 on the Bs and 325 on the As, well, that tells me that there's still a sense that even though that we're sitting here, you know, maybe at 125 percent of what you'd call book value now, that the shares are pretty cheap. The second note on capital allocation that I think was pretty apparent was Berkshire kind of flipped the switch, and it, instead of being what had been a net seller in the common stock portfolio, the, the stocks largely reside in the insurance companies. They flipped the switch and in the third quarter bought $17.5 billion worth of shares and sold just under $13 billion. So you've got a net buy of, call it $4.8 billion. It'll be interesting here, you know, obviously 45 days post the end of a quarter, you've got to file your your 13Fs. Uh, We'll have ours filed tomorrow night. During the quarter, there's some tangential evidence. The uh, Berkshire had filed a... uh, uh, a 13 schedule showing uh, a sale of about 100 million shares of Wells Fargo. If you kind of tease out kind of how the numbers flow through the 10Q, it, it looks like there was about $5 billion worth of shares sold in their finance group. So we make the assumption that either they gutted the rest of the Wells Fargo or continued to sell down portions of the JP Morgan, the PNC, 
the m and Bank. Uh, you know, my, my sense is they probably eliminated the Wells Fargo position entirely and that that's now gone. But all in, um, you know, you've got those sales. Uh, they, they also had a filing where they sold down a little bit of DeVita, um, took the position down by a couple million shares. That was about $160 million. But then what gets interesting is when you flip, flip over to the buy side of the ledger, and we know, we all saw that they bought, you know, shares of the five big Japanese trading companies. You know, we've, I had my analyst here sort of work up each of those businesses, and they're okay. They're very cheap on papers, trading at single-digit multiples. You know, fairly, you know, not, not materially highly levered assets, but a broad swath of industrial and trading and retail assets across Japan and, and with investments made globally. Um, and so, you know, that was about five or $6 billion use of capital. We all know they bought the Snowflake position for a little over $700 million, doubled that position. But it'll be interesting. And I'm not sure many or any have caught on to it, but there's another 11 to $12 billion that, that has not been announced that we'll see in the queue, but a big purchase. Um, and, and, it, and it's not the Dominion gas transmission and storage assets. It's, it's a common stock purchase. And my guess would be, my guess would be uh, that they probably have made a big investment in energy. I wouldn't rule out Chevron. Uh, I think less likely, but, you know, Mr. Buffett has owned ExxonMobil a couple times in the past. I think that's certainly a plausibility could consume the entire 11 or $12 billion purchase. Uh, you know, they own a couple billion a couple billion worth of General Motors. I think that's a possibility. But if I was a betting man, I would say you're probably going to see tomorrow uh, after the close, they probably made a big chunk of a, uh, capital directed toward energy, which, you know, these assets are incredibly washed out. As a percentage of the S&P, the energy sector is only 2%. We talked about that a few weeks ago. So it'll be interesting. Um, I think the $10 billion they spent on the Dominion gas assets were absolutely terrific. Um, we, you know, we're, we're going to move away from fossil fuels. We're going to do it incrementally. And if the population grows, I think the demand for uh, gas assets, the demand for even you know, all of the byproducts of fossil fuels uh, will just grow. Um, you know, we've been very active here buying things in the energy patch in the last few weeks. It's a, it's a big concentration for us now. And you know, in my investment career, I've not seen these assets as cheap as they are. So I applaud the Dominion deal. Um, you know, there, it just seems like Berkshire's pushing all the right levers. CapEx, they cut a little bit this year, but they're going to spend another 3 or $4 billion in the fourth quarter. Uh, CapEx for the year will be in excessive depreciation. So there's growth CapEx being spent. I think the thing that doesn't get any attention that I really find impressive is that Berkshire's doing what companies ought to be doing that lean on the debt structure, uh, that, that lean on debt for that portion of the structure of their, of, their, of their operations. Berkshire has been repaying and refunding an awful lot of short-term debt, and they've been terming out paper. Um, they've done it with Japanese issues at 0%. They've done it with some European issues at a little under 2 you know, all in, you know, if you if you just roll through the cash flow statement, you've, you know, the company just this three for the last nine months has repaid effectively about four and a half billion dollars worth of debt, but they've they've issued a net new or a new twelve. So, you know, there's a net new borrowing at seven and a half percent. A lot of that is at very long durations, 30, 40 year paper, um, having done the same in the prior year, six billion dollars of issuance in the prior year. So Everything they can do on the capital allocation front is exactly what you would want. They do it better than any business in, in the world. And, you know, Mr. Buffett has been criticized for not being very active uh, in terms of things like share repurchase. But, you know, I, I, contrary, I disagree. I think he's seeing opportunity. And there's an awful lot of cash going out the door in very attractive places, you know, very meaningful return places. And real broadly, I'll just quickly kind of scroll through some observations on on the big moving parts of the business, the railroad. So, 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 so my broad takeaway is there's very little, if any, permanent diminution of value at Berkshire. You know, the COVID has impacted a number of the moving parts in the interim, but with the recoveries that we've seen here in the third quarter, you know, I just don't see it. So in the rail, for instance, which, you know, I think is worth over $100 billion at Berkshire, on you know total value of seven hundred and fifty billion dollars, which is still my appraisal. My appraisal may not have grown much this year. I actually think by the end of the year it will have grown some, 
based on retention of, of operating profits. The company is still making good returns. You know, the rail, it, it, it's, it snapped back quite a bit. The rail was already in an economic downturn given our trade war with China. But you look at the, the you know, profits in the third quarter down about 8%, you know, call it 10% for the year. Uh, you know, profitability has actually improved relative to the revenue decline of 14% for both the quarter and the year. So there's a lot of good that's happened in the rail. They've taken a lot of cost out of the equation. Most of the costs in railroads are variable, not fixed. I talked about that last quarter. And so, you know, there's no diminution in the rail. Uh, the, the industrial end markets are still really weak. You know, they're moving around a lot of less sand and petroleum. The ag piece of the business is strong. It's been strong throughout the year. Coal's obviously dying, but they've taken a lot of cost out of the equation. And obviously the variable costs like compensation and fuel have matched down. And the fuel cost, which has plummeted with the price of, of, of crude and natural gas, you know, has been a big, it's been a big boon to uh, maintaining profitability. The energy business, the utility businesses, knocking the cover off the ball, like I said, they're going to you know, kind of bolt on here these these Dominion assets probably early next year, and that was a ten billion dollar purchase. But you know, profits are skyrocketing. There's huge tax benefits coming their way from the expenditures they're making on on wind in particular, but also solar. They've got the tax credits. Uh, you know, pipeline profitability is way up. They won on a rate case, but revenues are up. You know, offset a little bit by storage being down. Getting little note is the real estate brokerage operation where you know my wife works for one of the local brokers. She's knocking the cover off the ball. You know, the Berkshire Hathaway real estate's knocking the cover off the ball. Revenue is up something like 33% for the quarter and over 10% for the year. Profitability is through the roof. There's been refinancing activity that's helped them. It's just a huge positive. And it's grown to you know 10 to 15% of the value of oddly, uh, of the energy business. You know, it's still kind of one of those one-off oddities that, that, that you have certain subsidiaries that are housed within certain subsidiaries that don't make a lot of sense, but you know, it, that happens where the real estate brokerage is. But they're killing it. The insurance operation, you know, underwriting has been a little bit weaker. They've got some hurricane losses. Geico's profitability is down. You've got the rebates of 15% that they're kind of compelled to, to float through. You know, if you kind of follow frequencies and severities, uh, you know, Geico stands to be, you know, probably will lose money in the fourth quarter. You know, you wind up with a six-month period of time giving rebates to your customers. You had a period where a lot of driving wasn't taking place. Well, the number of miles being driven now is back up. The severities of injuries, because people were driving faster, are way up. So property losses are up. Collision losses are up. Are up. Bodily injury losses are up. Um, so you know, you're kind of back to normal loss ratios of about 80%. But, you know, given that, that, uh, you had this abatement period where you couldn't close on your customers for not paying their auto premiums that came to an end. And, you know, if you got into the, the, the footnotes of, of how the quarter progressed, they lost about 18% of their policies, uh, in the third quarter when they, they started being allowed to cancel policies. So we'll see how that evolves, but, you know, you know, because of the COVID, you know, you, the profitability was way up, but they're being forced to give a lot of that back. And it may turn around to harm them on the back end of that for the time being. So, you know, Geico and the auto industry, I've got investments in other auto insurers, is, is not in a hard market. But, but within the rest of the insurance operations, it's one of the hardest markets that you've seen. In reinsurance, pricing is up by a lot. Berkshire's share of COVID losses are pretty nominal. Premiums have continued to rise in reinsurance. Pre- premiums have continued to rise in their primary business. The specialty business, which they seeded a few years ago, is still growing fast. Losses have developed, which I think you would expect when you seed a business from the start. Uh, you know, I think they're just taking on a lot of business that's probably not going to develop as profitably as they thought. Uh, but you know, you have big hurricanes. We've talked about the hurricane season on the pod in past weeks. You know that that's cost the industry a bunch of money. It's cost Berkshire a bunch bunch of money. But broadly speaking, you've still got underwriting profitability, albeit at a much lower rate than than you you know would typically see in a normal year across Berkshire. And then you know this this MSR group, which is a quarter of the value of all of Berkshire Hathaway, it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, you know that period from March fifteen until probably beginning of June or the middle of June was a three-month period like we've never seen 
anywhere in the, the the history of economies. You know, never never have we seen the kind of collapse over such a short period of time. And that that hit this MSR group hard. But you know, broadly speaking, now for the for the quarter, revenues have managed to come back to being only down about four and a half or five percent for the nine months. They're still down eight or nine percent. Uh, but it's a huge, huge improvement in the third quarter. Profits are down. You don't have the same degree of variable cost. You've got a lot more fixed cost in a number of these operations. So, you know, profits have dropped by probably double the rate of revenue decline. So if revenues were down four and a half, you know, profits in the quarter were down probably twice that, call it 9%, and double it for the nine months. But again, enormous improvement. The industrial businesses, as you would expect with industrial production still being down broadly globally, by 25 or 30 percent, are really weak. Lubrizol is weak. Precision cast parts, which has been a just a veritable disaster from the start. We saw a 10 billion dollar write off on what was a 33 or 34 billion dollar purchase. Obviously, when they bought it, the gas turbine business was already weak, and then you get into the COVID and the decline in energy, which is just just eviscerated airline production. And so most of so most of Precision's businesses are very weak. I think they overpaid for it. It's it's a huge black eye. You've never seen just these big giant write-offs at Berkshire and a $10 billion write-off on a 30 plus billion dollar acquisition is a biggie. So, but outside of the industrial businesses, there's an awful lot of good that's going on. Um, Clayton Holmes has been just the shining star in that MSR group. They continue to grow sales at 20, 30% clip profitability. At that clip, they're benefiting from a lot of the refinancing, but you have uh, you know site-built units growing at like a thirty percent annual clip. Um, it's just been a huge, a huge bright spot. And then even you know outside of Clayton, all, all of their other building businesses, which would be you know Shaw and Johns Manville and Acme Brick and all those, MyTech here in St. Louis, you know where revenues were down five or six percent, uh, you know for the for the full nine months. They're only down one for the quarter, and profitability has gone way up in the third quarter. Actually, is up over 2019 levels. So, you know, a number of those a number of those subs inside of Berkshire have done a really good job on cost containment. Forest River, which I kind of knocked at the end of uh, the last quarter for not participating with the Winnebagos and the Thors, they actually saw their revenues up 38 or 39 percent for the quarter. And what's interesting is if you look at the stocks of Winnebago and Thor and the publicly traded. Uh, RV companies, they, they've started to come back down to reality. So you just got to wonder once we get through the COVID or, you know, now that we're kind of post the summer, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, vacation season, whether that that increase in, in revenues and profitability is durable remains to be seen. So, you know, I add it all up. I, I think, you know, if you, again, go back to the big moving parts, no diminution of value at the railroad more value so tremendous growth in the in the energy operations you know the the MSR group is is greatly recovered relative to where it was 3 months ago and i think by year end you know, you're looking at a year that's maybe going to be down 5 or 6% profitability so you've not gutted that business and then the insurance operation is way better the stock portfolio is now up for the year 8 or 9% apple has been a home run it's now almost you know, almost 50%, 47, 48%, despite what was a, a nominal sale of Apple, the $4 billion sale, what looks like in the quarter. Um, you know, you you look through and if if my number for normal profitability is $40 billion for all of Berkshire, 10 billion of that comes from the retained earnings of just the common stock investees. You have another $5 billion coming in dividends from that group. And so, you know, you've got less than a third of 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 the assets being the stock portfolio, and um, you know an even smaller percentage uh, of, of, of you know a higher percentage of the earning power, probably you know three eighths of the earning power, comes from the stock portfolio. Uh, it, it's up for the year, and I think when you look through to the profitability of Apple and a lot of the businesses, they're fine. The banks, which were a big holding at the beginning of the year, they've been gutted since then. The bank's profits are way down. Coke's profits is nominally down, but the rest of those businesses, you know, there's just not a lot of uh, there's not a lot of diminution to that ten billion dollars of of what what I would call kind of retained earnings of the investees. And so, broadly speaking, I think there's no decline in what I'd call the intrinsic value of Berkshire. And 
you know, when I sit down and do the final numbers at the end of the year, you know, as long as we don't, you know, lock down the global economy like we did uh, starting March 15, March 17, you know, I think it's fair to assume that Berkshire, because of retained profits of their operating earnings, is going to be in better shape and be more valuable at year end 20 than it was at year end 19. So, you know, I could kind of wax on forever, but why don't I, why don't I flip to you guys for your thoughts or, or comments? Yeah, I don't have much to add. The only thing that jumps out to me is some of the criticism that you alluded to where some of the peanut gallery loves to chime in and say that management's lost it or whatever the case may be. And I, I just, it, it is a striking example of something that's always fascinated me, which is this notion that with hindsight, there was only one way for history to go. And it's just obviously not the case. So sure, now in hindsight, everybody's going to harp on Buffett and wish that he'd spent all this money in March and April. Uh, but it was completely different in March and April. The odds were different. The knowledge and information available was different. And you just don't get to live life that way. So I think the people that are critical of decisions in hindsight and take this after the fact determinative determinative analysis, you know, to its extreme are just really ill-informed and, and prone to making some really dumb decisions over time. Well, there's a misnomer, uh, you know, given this, this knocking him for the lack of repurchase activity and this mountain of cash, which I put, kind of poked fun at Twitter uh, at, at the media over the weekend. You know, universally, every media outlet went to the headline number of cash at what, what would have been $145.7 billion dollars but you've got to net out the payable that appears on the right side of the balance sheet for payables for buying T-bills. You really only have $139 billion in cash, but still, it's an enormous number. Rarely is it put into the perspective of Berkshire's total assets are $830 billion, and not all of that $139 billion is earmarked for investment. You know, the, the company has pointed to $20 billion that they will always have on hand in the event of any exogenous disaster, crisis, I've always looked at that number as, as more likely one year's worth of insurance losses to be paid, which is approaching $40 billion. But if you look at the last 20 years, 22 years since the Gen Ray deal, and you look at the amount of cash that has been kept on hand as a percentage of total assets, or you look at cash as a percentage of the equity of the business, you know that, that number has crept up a little bit, but it's not wildly high. And I think there's a permanent cash reserve inside of Berkshire, but you know, again, I think you look at people that don't understand the business. They they want to compare $139 billion in cash to $415 or whatever billion dollars in shareholders' equity. And that's that's not the right number. It's cash as a percentage of total assets, not cash to equity. And you can say the same thing about all the subs. So uh, I think, you know, given $24 billion now spent in less than three years on share repos at very attractive prices, that's an incredible use of cash. And remember, there's no shareholder-based compensation. I mean, this isn't Twitter. I mean, this is, this is. There's no share issuance going out the door. This is a genuine repurchase of shares at a material discount to intrinsic value, which is immensely accretive for the common shareholder. And you know, the the, the media and the criticism is just misguided on that front. Chris, I would love to hear you expand a little on why you think it was the energy patch that was on the receiving end of uh, the big investment. Because I'm just reflecting back on the spring when Buffett said, you know, he was kind of speaking to his mistake in Occidental, had lost a pretty significant sum of money there. And it's like, you know, on the one hand, sure, he just made a mistake in energy. He kind of got out of that with, with a wound. Um, still maybe licking that wound. But he also said something to the effect of like oil production is going to drop a lot over the next few years because it doesn't pay to drill. Um, and, you know, thinking through like the marathon capital cycle framework, that seems to suggest it's, you know, maybe close to a pretty good time to put a lot of money in there, right? You want to get your money into the space when everyone else is kind of, when, when production's coming back, uh, cutting back. Um, but it just feels like directionally inconsistent with what he's talked about on elephant hunting and having this recent uh, bad experience there. Well, I'd like to answer that I think it's energy because I've been spending a hell of a lot of money in energy, but that's not really the answer. Um, you know, I think you've got some evidence as, as to as to a narrowing of of where the 
11 or 12 billion might have gone. You know, if you flow through the footnote in the in the queue, investments in equity securities, you can see where they've taken the cost basis of the banks, insurance, and finance group down by about $4 billion. The market value of that group has dropped. And so that's when you kind of back into the, the banks and the finance companies in that group, um, along with the filing for wells, where the wells would have been whacked down. That's where I make the assumption that the rest of the wells is gone. So you didn't put a net, you didn't put that incremental 11 or 12 billion into that group. Consumer products, uh, you know, you have that nominal sale in all likelihood of Apple, which is where Apple would fall, the consumer products group. Market value of that group was way up, but it's 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 a big increase in the cost basis of what they call commercial industrial and other. And it it just lends itself to only so many industries and so many businesses. You know, I think the Occidental, um, the preferred, is a different animal from the common. Um, Todd or Ted had made the original investment in the common. Occidental is not a great business. Occidental is a business that at too low oil prices could very well go the way of the dinosaur and disappear through a Chapter 11 filing. You know, I, I, I you know, I, I alluded, I, you know, it could be a GM. I mean, it could be an auto manufacturer. Hell, they might have bought Fiat Chrysler, which for, you know, some moments there during the downturn with what has been a much better balance sheet uh, than in years past. You know, they've done a terrific job there. We don't own any shares, but, you know, Chrysler, uh, uh, Fiat Chrysler has done a great job and the stock was trading in a mid-teen earnings. Um, GM is a candidate. Um, they've already got the investment in GM. Uh, I think he's a fan of Mary Barra. Uh, so I think that's a possibility. I just look at energy as, as, as so washed out. And all of the work that I've done indicates that, you know, if we were doing 100 million barrels a day uh, going into the, the year and pre-COVID globally in terms of global demand for oil, you know, at the March lows, the April lows, we were probably <laughs> at a demand rate of maybe, you know, a quarter off of that. So 75 million. Well, here we are now, you know, here in November. And, you know, I think we're probably down 6 million barrels a day. So kind of running at a 94 million rate. My working, my working assessment says that over the next 20 years, even though Europe and even though California have said we're going to go to a zero carbon or a no carbon footprint, there's no physical, plausible way to get there without continued growth in oil and gas. Those distribution assets that they're buying are terrific. You know, you take the big integrated oils and they've been rolling up a lot of the bankruptcies that have been taking place in the Permian Basin and elsewhere. So you've had a lot of wildcat crazy spending that's gone on uh, in the years leading up to 2015. None of it was economic. So I think there's a lot of assets that have gravitated toward more rational hands. Um, you've seen some big acquisitions here in the last few weeks. And I think it's just a place where he can get a lot of money invested, where Berkshire can get a lot of money invested at very attractive prices on assets that are perceived as dirty and assets that are perceived as going away. But I think, you know, if you're willing to spend $10 billion on transmission and storage assets and an LNG import-export terminal, from Dominion, you have a belief that there's a place for natural gas in, in the long term. And I'm, I'm very much in that camp. Like I say, we've spent a whole bunch of money in the last month in the oil patch and wouldn't have predicted the big turn uh, on Monday, kind of post the announcement of Biden's win. But I was spending a bunch of money last week, you know, during the election week. And I'm lucky I got in what I got in because there was an enormous rally on Monday. But I, I, I could be very wrong. I'm, I'm totally speculating, though, Elliot. I, I don't know what is going to have been bought. I know they're going to have to announce that 11 to $12 billion of something has been bought, and it's got to be in commercial and industrial. It could be any number of things. I just know if I were sitting there you know, at, 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 at the, in the cockpit in Omaha, I'd be sniffing out energy assets, and he has a proven history of, of buying energy assets at pretty opportunistic times. And just to um, Chris's point, there's a, there's a really good uh, Q3 commentary I would recommend out by uh, Horizon Kinetics, uh, in which basically they devote that whole uh, report to energy. And it makes a pretty interesting contrarian case as to why, um, you know, energy is, uh, could be the bargain of, I think they call it the bargain of a lifetime. Um, so that you know, there's there's definitely something there. Um, you know, 
we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. But um, Chris, I wanted to ask you a little bit about Apple because uh, that four billion is is just really quite interesting. And and you know, what do you think is the chance that they might have that that might have been the beginning of actually a much bigger sale that could have continued uh, into Q four? Well, I've been hoping of all hopes here in the last couple of months that as Apple has run up to a 2 trillion plus market cap to, I guess, 2.2 or 2.3 trillion at the peak, you know, on a 20% margin, you know, doing, you know, 55, $60 billion in profit and 250 plus billion in revenues, revenues not growing near as fast as the world thinks they're growing. Uh, you know, I've kind of, I've kind of hoped they've sold them. Um, you know, at first blush, when you go through that same investment and equity security footnote, and I kind of tie it out, there, there are different calculations of the 13F that various sources get wrong. Bloomberg's calculation is different from whale wisdoms. If you go into the 13F filings, if, if, you go into the, if you go into the filing that Berkshire makes quarterly and you add up each of the subsidiary shares, you have to back out things like Mr. Buffett shares. Occasionally, they have the pension fund that owns shares, so it's never exactly easy to get the true count. But if you do the quarter over quarter comp on the price per share at the end of the quarter relative to the market value, it looks like there's probably $4 billion gone. And John, I would say to answer your question, you know, on what was a 35, let's call it billion dollar investment that has risen to, you know, over $110 billion now. You know, a back to you know, Phil's point, <laughs> you got to give the guy credit for the investment that was made when Apple was very inexpensive. I mean that that seventy eighty billion dollar gain at eighty billion dollars, it's two years worth of all Berkshire profits as I calculate them. Huge home run. I just think the economics of the business at the current market cap kind of borrow a lot from any future growth. And so I so so my my sense would be if indeed there was a four billion, let's call it sale, my guess is that's probably coming from Todd or Ted, who were the original owners of the original core position. And it was only Mr. Buffett with his much larger pool of capital that came along later and made the material investment. So I my guess is that was a Todd or Ted sale and not a Mr. Buffett sale. But you know, my hope as a shareholder is that we don't do what Berkshire did with Coca-Cola and keep it when it was 45% of the stock portfolio and a stock that has done nothing for 20 years has now shrunk down towards, I don't know, 10% of the stock portfolio. I don't want to see Apple kind of lose that perception of top line growth and get it re-rated down to a more appropriate multiple and see what's now 45 plus percent of the stock portfolio tread water at best for the next five or 10 years. I think there's an opportunity with the capital gains tax rate at 21%. There are losses in the portfolio that, that they've taken in some of the financials. You know, Berkshire's not keen on paying a lot of taxes on capital gains. They've structured their affairs to swap assets instead of actually write checks to the government. It's a very tax efficient business, the way they've structured it and the way they operate it. So I, I don't know. My again, I I in this case, I'd love to see some taxes paid, and I'd love to see that shorter. But that that's my working case on Apple being overvalued. So I don't know. I, I again, I think you know, long winded answer, but probably Todd or Ted may not be indicative of uh, what, what the beginnings of a broad brush sale. You know, they've proven Mr. Buffett has proven when he starts selling down a position like he's done with Wells Fargo that he's going to tend to gut it, you know, which brings up another thought just going into the 13F filing. It's entirely plausible that in that finance group, they did, they sold the rest of Wells, but they also sold the rest of JP Morgan and M&T and PNC. And they could have then, in terms of reconciling the footnote of the, of the queue, they could have made an additional purchase in finance and financial in, in, in finance or banks or, or what have you. So, it may not have been a five billion dollar sale from that group. It may have been a ten billion dollar sale from that group, and then a three or a four or five billion dollar purchase. You could also get the math to work on the reconciliation that way. So, you know, I'm I'm very uh, not entirely sure what's happened on the on the F, and it's just really for fun that I try to do it. But the answer to the Apple question is, I'd like to see it be the beginnings of taking money off the table at a pretty favorable opportunistic price. 
Okay, great. Well, thank you, Chris, for uh, another terrific analysis of Berkshire. I think we'll now go to Phil for uh, your uh, topic, Phil. Go ahead. Sure, thanks. So Chris kind of hinted at this a minute ago indirectly uh, regarding what happened on Monday, which I found fascinating for many reasons. But just to step back um, a little bit, this goes ties into what Elliot and John and I were talking about last week, which was kind of the the process for structuring the valuation uh, of an individual company. And I've always thought it was very helpful to look at a company first as a business. And again, does it drive your personal interest? Can you even understand it? You know, Do you have any ability to forecast where it's going to be in three, five, and 10 years? Those sorts of questions have to be a first filter before you go anywhere else. But then as you do start trying to put a you know, a range of reasonable numbers on what you might pay for the whole business, I think it's very helpful to always keep in mind the lens of a credit investor. So starting out with how credit worthy the company is, how reliable the company's ability to pay interest is, and then stepping down and, and really looking at it from the same perspective as a, as a credit investor in an equity perspective is that, you know, the equity can only be worth whatever the residual available cash flows are. And so if you looked at it as a as a senior or junior obligation somewhere in the in the capital structure and the ability ability to service that obligation what kind of ability does the company have to service its quote unquote equity obligations and so if you look at it from that perspective you know one thing that becomes immediately important of course is duration and so as we were talking about with Elliot and John last week you know we can sort of ignore for now the impact of interest rates and discount rates because i think we covered that pretty well last week um, and so I won't I won't rehash it here, but I'd encourage everybody to go back and listen to it from last week. I thought it was a, a great conversation. But if you if you just take the the quote unquote coupons available to service the the so called equity obligation, it becomes you know a, a much more practical exercise. I think rather than guessing whether the stock's going to go up or down, or guessing what next quarter or next year's earnings are going to be, you're really thinking more as a business owner first. And so when you put it in that lens. You know, one of the things that jumped out to me, you know, to Chris's point, was about some of the crazy extreme moves we've seen this year alone. Partly, they're very much understandable. What we went through in February, March, April was was truly nuts, and and I don't think a lot of people were prepared prepared for it, and it was truly an earthquake. I get all that, but if you look just in the last week or two, you know, particularly here in the U.S., you know, we had the election, obviously. I would argue that, you know, what you saw on the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of last week was kind of business as usual, right? The things that were doing well and winning kind of continued to win. The election was was obviously not yet called, but it was not necessarily a big flip-flop in what the expectations were of that result with the possible exception of Congress. And, and again, it just wasn't the market's reaction to that. I don't think that was so interesting. But then what happened was on Sunday night, Monday morning, we got this news about the Pfizer vaccine, which is obviously fantastic. And, and we're all hoping for a favorable outcome there. But there's a business that I own, and I won't name it because I'm not in the business of giving investment recommendations, especially um, without you know proper caveats and, and you know, having people do their own work first. But the, I'll, I'll paint it with a broad brush that it's a business that's old and established and has a dominant market share. And it's a very long duration tale of cash flows. So it really shouldn't be that sensitive to near-term swings and assumptions. And so again, if if you thought the vaccine was going to fail or all the vaccines were going to fail and this proved you wrong, you know, I, I could get that. I don't think that was anybody's working assumption coming into this. So it was really more about the timing, I guess, combined with the, you know, the the relief rally, for lack of a better word. But this is a business where, it doesn't have direct exposure to the virus. It certainly has indirect exposure to the virus. And it's been a little beaten up this year. And then because of this vaccine news, it was up more than 20% on Monday morning alone. And it's really just bonkers because that, you know, it, it's just a classic overreaction in both directions. I mean, nothing was so bad that the stock should have been down a ton. And nothing about this vaccine is so good that it should have made the business 20% more valuable on Monday than it was on Friday. Um, and so it just got me thinking to, you know, obviously there's market dynamics at play here and that that explains most of the story. But I wonder if we were to, you know, make a concerted effort to tie more of our assumptions back to a bond like approach in all ways. Right. Taking an upside down approach first instead of what can I make, what can I lose? 
and then taking the approach and valuation as to what can I what can I really service? What kind of obligations can I service throughout the liability structure um, rather than just sort of some of the nonsense like, you know, oh, this is going to grow some KPI that doesn't really necessarily translate reliably into value. Um, so I wonder if, if that's something you guys find useful, if you think I'm missing something as to what explains some of these crazy moves we saw on Monday morning or, or, or just in general. I'll throw it out there at that. Well, Phil, I would say... I would say, and, and, and this won't go to your duration um, correlation, um, you know, stocks in general are long duration assets. But I go back to when Trump won the 2016 election. And I remember at midnight, the networks telling everybody that uh, JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs and all of them had had teams headed back into the office. And so there was a there was capital on a hair trigger that was ready to was ready to be put to work on the open the next morning that Wednesday morning, and I don't know how large the capital was, but I, I, I go back and reflect on the pat answer that I got used to giving in 1998 and 1999 and the first two and a half months of 2000, a pat answer that I've kind of gotten reaccustomed to you know, for 2018, 2019, parts of 2020. And that was, look, if everybody in the world is going to be a passive investor and in the late 90s, they're going to own a bunch of tech and internet stocks. Today, if everybody in the world is going to own the S&P 500 as a passive investor and we're going to own the five big tech stocks and a handful of others and we're not going to own anything else, then at the margin, liquidity disappears. And if if you simply isolate passive investing, if everybody owns the S&P 500, and I've said this for, for the, you know, 20 of my 30 years investing, then the value of everything else has to go to zero. And so there's enough capital that's going to move around on the announcement by the media that, that, that the Democrats have taken the White House. At the same moment we announce a successful vaccine, there was enough directional money uh, bet at the margin that was going to drive prices in crazy ways. Because, I mean, what, what few active value investors are left, their investments have been made. You know, they're, they're not sitting on, and I, I can't, I shouldn't say that, but, you know, there's just not an enormous amount of cash sitting on the sidelines waiting to make these kinds of short-term directional bets. So a lot of the money that's going to, that that will have gravitated toward places into passive or you know into whatever strategy has already been made and there was enough money at the margin whether it was the wall street banks or whether it was a handful of big pension funds or university endowments that had money to go on the successful announcement of a vaccine or the successful announcement of an election that was going to really distort the movement of prices i mean i can tell you the energy investments that i was making just Last week, the the movement on Monday, I mean, I had some stocks in the portfolio that were up 30 and 35% that I had just bought a week prior, and I've never seen that. But, you know, the last time I've seen that kind of disparity in price movements, both up and down, was immediately post, well, really on the March 10, 2000 peak when, when the tech bubble broke. And you had just an extraordinary numbers of days where, you know, you know, stock, you know, my stocks were up 5, 10, 15% in a day. The market was down uh, like percentages in a day. And then you'd get reversals and that went on for a couple of years. Um, and, and again, I think it's largely because a lot of the money to be put to work at the margin has already been invested at the margin. That's kind of my simple take on it. Yeah, and I think yeah, that, that's so, fair enough too. So I didn't mean to, sorry, I, I want to hear... Elliot, for sure. I guess I should clarify too. Like, I don't, I think you're exactly right, Chris, on a lot of those points. And I don't really spend too much of my own time trying to diagnose what makes the market go up or down. It's almost always a fool's errand. So that's not really my my primary interest. I guess, you know, I was probably poorly phrasing my point a minute ago. I think maybe the bigger question here is, okay, you know, things get crazy. Like, like you said, in 2016, the market, the futures went limit down before they turned positive in the same night. So, I mean, it was, it's crazy. And that's always going to happen, right? Markets do crazy things and that's just built into the system. But do you think 
this attitude of looking at equity through a, a credit lens and looking at your valuation process as an equity investor in terms of a, a cash flow available to service the equity and then taking this lens of duration, because you're right, equity is, let's hope, by definition, a very long duration asset. There's just nothing to have argued, uh, you know, based on anything we saw between Friday and Monday, that there was really that big of a change in the in the dra- I mean, again, unless you want to bake in some crazy number in the in the discount rate you were using, which again probably should have gone up, not down. I don't know. It, it, call it a wash, even like it's that's what I mean. It just sort of makes it hard to look at it from such a short term perspective, and you just kind of shrug and say, "All right, that's kind of a ridiculous game, and I'm not going to play that." So, Elliot, go ahead. Sorry. Let me- yeah, no, I mean, I think it's hard not to speak first to the fact that why why does this move happen? You know, I think it, it's nice to hope in theory that most investors are underwriting to companies as businesses and thinking in pretty rational terms. But when you get moves that are as extreme as what happened on Monday, um, it really just says positioning was so far offside. And I think it's a combination of like some of the more high turnover hedge funds who end up, um, you know, maybe they were pressing on shorts in the um, COVID impacted sectors to fund longs in the COVID winners. Um, And, you know, that quickly has to unwind in one day because there's an imminence to like a 2021 vaccine. Um, For what it's worth, I don't understand. Like that was pretty much the basic expectation for a while now. There had been like incremental data points that were affirming that as the path to when we should start expecting it. Uh, Some people had hoped for sooner, but, you know, I think in the uh, Good Judgment Project, for most of the year they had been expecting, um, or for most of the time since March, they'd been expecting a vaccine by like mid-2021. And that had pulled forward to maybe as early as like later this year when the president kept insisting that might be the case. Um, but either way, you know, like this is what you'd expect. So how do you get such extreme movements? And I think the only way to explain it uh, is offsides uh, positioning. Um, you know, maybe it was as simple as people thought they had a little more time to do some work on some of these impacted names and they'd uh, buy them or, you know, uh, sometime a little bit down the line, had a little more time to get that work done. And then suddenly you get a, a headline on a Monday morning and you're like, oh, God, right now I got to get this position on because I'd wanted this all year. As for like thinking about uh, equity and bond terms, you know, I think that's in, in the ideal, with, especially when you're at a certain point of maturity, that's that's really appealing. And that's the way we should, in a lot of ways, think about certain things. It doesn't work in all kinds of equity. I think the growthier the company, the harder it is to think in those ways. Um, you, the way you were talking about it reminds me of like, I was I, I read about this concept that Sanjay Bakshi uh, had he he has a blog fund due professor which I find uh, some some really excellent writings on. Um, he talked about this uh, setup that he called the debt capacity bargain, where you look at how much operating cash flow a company makes. You look at the prevailing, um, you know, call it what whatever the the right interest uh, rate would be for that quality of asset. Uh, you think what sort of interest coverage uh, would be appropriate. So in cyclicals, you're 5X for stable businesses, 3X. um, And then calculate what an EV would be for that business if they fully uh, levered to an appropriate cap structure. And if the market cap is less than that EV, you buy it. Um, And I thought that was an interesting framework to approach like a bond-like valuation to equity. Um, so just throwing that out there, I, I thought that was pretty interesting. But really, I think you know you you can't rationalize some of these moves. It's it's purely about positioning, and you know it it did really feel like even heading into the election, positioning was like really offsides for where the world might have been heading. And you know who knew what would make the rubber band snap, but but that was it. Fair enough, John. What do you think? Well, I like the concept. I, I think. Uh, a few investors, kind of long-term oriented investors, have talked about uh, that concept. I think Tom Russo uh, may be uh, one of those. Um, It's a tough one to apply when you've got a company that maybe doesn't have uh, free cash flow at the moment, kind of the the growthier, some of the growthier companies. But but as soon as you have some free cash flow, let's say a a Google or a Facebook, um, it's a really interesting concept. Actually, 
it it tends to push me more toward the high quality growers like a Facebook, and I'm not recommending Facebook here uh, by any means, just using it as a case study. But if you have a company where you feel uh, very, very confident that um, it is a very powerful company, it'll grow over time, even if you have a, a kind of a low um, you know, FCF yield, let's say only uh, a couple percent um, can be enough in this kind of a an interest rate environment if you feel confident that that, you know, 2% will grow over time. And so I do like that concept because um, kind of historically, I've just shunned anything with a PE above, you know, let's say 30 just for, for fun. Um, but if you look at it as a as a bond and you've got um, you know a two percent current yield on something where you feel very confident that this is going to double um, some years down the road and keep uh, growing, um, that makes it more palatable for me to kind of look at some of these higher uh, PE companies. Yeah, and I guess I should clarify too. I'm not a stickler in any sense of. Uh, a, a bond, like a strict bond math style valuation of an equity, because obviously the coupons are not fixed. That's what makes it interesting and fun and and profitable is if you get those coupons right. And when coupons can grow, that's an enormously powerful thing. It's 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 kind of the first part of it, which is looking at the capacity of the company to pay as it stands now. And I think to a lot of people's points, uh, I think a huge difference today versus maybe prior periods is that a lot of the tech companies that are so, and, and I even hate the term tech, to be honest, but a lot of the most successful companies that would be characterized as tech have unbelievable balance sheets and unbelievable cash flow generation capabilities. And so they don't have any near-term concerns about meeting their obligations and all that cash flow can accrue to the equity when and if it comes in. So if you can forecast you know, what that looks like in the future, great, you're going to do extremely well. So I, I think it was more the comment about kind of starting with that lens rather than things that I find less helpful and, and, and or, you know, the investors, I think that really get sideswiped by completely ignoring the credit lens. Um, but then secondarily, I mean, again, so I don't, I don't have any hard and strict criteria about ability to pay today, you know, whether in terms of a free cash flow yield or anything like that. I mean, I don't, I think we've all, Chris and I probably share Costco as one of our favorite companies of all time. And for many years, Costco showed, you know, just a simple free cash flow burn because they were building so many new stores. And that was obviously the exact right thing they should do. And we can point to example after example of great companies that that burn cash. But the ability to pay was always there. And they always structured things in a credit-friendly way so that if something unexpectedly bad happened, they could get out from underneath it and it could, you know, still get a, get a reasonably favorable result. So that's really what I'm looking for. And then again, I mean, I, I've kind of stretch this off into a tangent. So I apologize. But it just it just struck me that through that lens, there really wasn't much case to be made for a lot of companies that I saw on Monday that were up 20, 30, 40, 50% even. The, their ability to pay had not changed that much in a day, that's for sure. I'm going to run the risk, Phil, of sounding like a fool because I'm entirely thinking out loud. But having missed the conversation last week, which I wound up listening to a couple nights ago while I was working out. I thought it was terrific. And, and, you know, you guys each had great topics. And you talked about Twitter, really, in your segment, Phil, and about reverse DCFs, Elliot, in your segment. And, and, and I guess to tie into this, this notion of, of credit analysis and duration, I suppose getting away from interest rates, which was your original comment today, Phil, Again, I'm, I'm I'm thinking out loud here, but you know, I, I suppose you would equate in the equity sense your longer duration assets to those that are going to require, and you can fill in the blanks on the variables, and it would go to your DCF, reverse DCF, Elliot. But tell me what the sales growth is going to be. Tell me what the ultimate profitability, the margin structure is going to look like. Tell me how much capital it's going to take to grow. Tell me what the dilution is going to wind up being from any share issuance and then tell me what the final future multiple is going to wind up being. So you've got five variables there and the larger premium that you're willing to pay for today's dollar of revenues and today's dollar of profits would absolutely 
uh, lend itself to a duration type calculation. Um, and I would even argue that you'd throw in the notion of convexity. And, and by that, I suppose I would mean that if, if the premium that you're paying is so high for a business that your upside is fairly quantifiable based on the, the outcomes of those five variables, but the convexity is huge. I mean, the downside risk is huge because if you're wrong on any mix of those five variables, there's an enormous amount of downside that, that comes with falling short of, of conventional expectation. And, and, and I think all the duration math, the, the duration math the, and the convexity math that we all learned when we were studying for our CFAs, in my case, God, almost 30 years ago, 25 years ago, more than 25 years, would lend itself to the, the, just the conventional valuation equation on common stocks. Well, that's just it. And that's well said. So again, I mean, we're getting into the weeds a little bit, but yeah, if you, you generally want convexity in a lot of cases, but it, it can cut both ways. And so to your point, I mean, you know, if you start from a risk averse perspective and you make sure you can't lose much, but then as you're calculating what the equity might be worth, you know, there's scenarios where it dramatically works in your favor and this duration turns into some long tailed monster that, you know, not only grows, but grows a lot and grows for a really long time. But then if you get it wrong, you know, you can be really wrong. So that, that's that's well said. And I just think that framework is is very powerful. And so again, if you'd done the first step of that, and okay, the balance sheet's relatively clean, this business is going to survive, you know, whatever. So look, if it's a even some of the stuff in the pandemic here that's been really crushed, where three months could make a huge difference, airlines, cruise companies, whatever, that I get. This company that I have in mind is as long duration as and as reliable a stream of cash flows as maybe any I've ever seen in a corporate setting. And so how's it 20% more valuable on Monday morning? I mean, it really, it, it just shouldn't impact the calculation or the, the, you know, the overall value that much. So um, anyway. So I'm curious, and it begs the question, do you whack the bid on Monday morning and sell? Well, I personally didn't in this case because I didn't understand why the company was down so much. They're the quoted price of the company was down so much this year. So it was really just kind of recovering lost ground. And, and you know, this gets into a whole other topic, which is how to take advantage of this sort of thing as an investor or a portfolio manager. And it's something that I frankly don't think is a particular strength of mine. Some people are better at it than I am for sure. Um, I think it's tricky, uh, but there's there's definitely a case to be made. Um, to your point, if you, if you can sniff out that you think people are set up the wrong way based on the odds of what you think is coming down the pike, then yeah, you should try to take advantage of that. Yeah, that's the hard part. And then sometimes it's a better buy to kind of step in even afterwards because it's oh, a little sure. easier. Yeah. But that's hard to do. It is um, hard to do. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 take, the, the, the taking advantage of part is just Mr. Market and his manic depressive state that we all owe so much to Ben Graham for. Yeah, exactly right. That's what it is, right? The pendulum swings and you don't change any of your underwriting assumptions, but the price is meaningfully different. It's a, it's a totally different setup, but I, yeah, I, it's such a hard situation to know. Like um, when you sit there on Monday morning, you see the news about the vaccine, you're like, great, this is fantastic. Everything should be, you know, kind of, uh, people should be optimistic and feeling good about the world in general. And then you open the portfolio, like, whoa, some of these moves are as extreme as you could possibly imagine. Everything was up or down at least five plus percent. And it's hard not to think just about like what the average person is thinking and how they're acting in that very moment. No good answers, though. There are none. Well, I think this is just a version of, um, you know, the volatility we see in almost any public company over the course of a year. I mean, you take the 52 week high and low and uh, businesses, <laughs> business value just does not change in that way. Um, so that just kind of shows you that at any given moment in time, uh, the market's probably off. The only question is by how much. And at those extremes of a low or a high that you see in the course of a year, I think there it just comes down to uh, the psychological factors, right? You've got the fear at the low, you've got the exuberance at the high. And if you can keep those uh, psychological factors in check, you're just in such a better position as an investor. 
Yeah, that's well said. All right. Well, anyone else uh, want to throw in anything uh, before we call it the day? I guess that's it. Thanks, guys. A great discussion. Thanks also, everyone, for listening. And uh, we'll uh, talk to you all uh, next week. Take care. Thanks, guys. Thank you for listening to This Week in Intelligent Investing, brought to you exclusively by MOI Global, the research-driven membership organization. Learn more at moiglobal.com.